birthday this week. Also, Jonathan Amber celebrating anniversary today. One year ago today, we were really busy. <laughs> Wanda and I were. Wanda's still celebrating. She's wearing her dress from last year for that. So, <laughs> so but uh, we're glad to get all that behind us. I think that's all the announcements I have. We have a couple of additions to the prayer list. Continue to remember Minnie Lou. She's been struggling through some allergies. It's that time of year, isn't it, Minnie Lou? And I think everybody's going through some of those things, so be remembering her. Lisa's been struggling with a virus this week and has got her kind of exhausted, so be remembering her. Also, uh, a fellow named Chip has had some fluid on the lungs. Remember him as he struggles through those things. And that's uh, Kim's brother. Is that right, Peely? Kim's brother. Remember Chip. And then also Karen with her mother, uh, still, has she gone into nursing home yet? Minnie Lou are still sometime in May. And that's a very difficult decision. I know it's tearing Karen's nerves up. So, yep. So play, pre, please pray for Karen on that. Also, uh, Scott Morgan has, has developed leukemia. So please remember Scott as well. I think that's all I have. Do you have any others? We need more additions to these things or? Well, if not, we'll start our service this morning as we look to our God in prayer. Let's pray. Oh, God, again, we do thank you so much that you have us in the palm of your hand and you care for us. And you have brought us here this morning to come and to worship you. Father, help us as we worship. Guide everything that we do that it would please you, it would glorify you. For you are a God so worthy of our worship. Oh, God, we do thank you so much that you have taught us how to pray that we may come before your throne and pour your, our hearts out before you, O God, both, both sharing our needs and desires and also praising you, glorifying you for all the things you have done for us. We do thank you for that prayer, O God, that our Savior has taught us. Be with us now as we pray it together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, forever. Amen. Thank you, Wanda. If you turn in your Bibles to Acts chapter 7, beginning with verse 55, as Acts chapter 7, beginning with verse 55, We'll be reading from the NIV version. Now let's hear what the Word of God has for us in Acts chapter 7, verse 55 through 60. But Stephen, full of the Holy Spirit, looked upon to heaven and saw the glory of God and Jesus standing at the right hand of God. Look, he said, I see heaven open and the Son of Man standing at the right hand of God. At this they covered their ears and yelling at the top of their voices. They all rushed at him, dragged him out of the city and began to stone him. Meanwhile the witnesses laid their coats at the feet of a young man named Saul. While they were stoning him, Stephen prayed, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When he had said this, he fell asleep. Thanks be reading to God's word. The title of my sermon today is Goat. <laughs> and yes, Edna questioned me about that also. What are you going to preach about a goat? Well, I want to tell you what goat means here in a moment like that. And we've all heard our, I know my grandmother used to call my grandfather all the time, says, where's that old goat at, you know, and things like that. So we, we got a lot of terminologies for, for goat. But in the world of sports, being a goat usually meant a negative. You did something really bad or, or something that messes up a game or a series or, or even their career is kind of slicking down and says, God, he's an old goat. You know, he just can't do nothing. Uh, if you think about the basketball player Bill Buckner, who made a fielding error that cost the Red Sox uh, game number six of the World Series in 1986, he cost them to lose the World Series. And he was kind of named as a goat then. And there was a basketball player, Chris Weber. Uh, he called a timeout that, that caused Michigan to lose their 1993 NCAA, NCAA championship, and he was named. I mean, he, he's, you know, these guys stick out like a sore, sore thumb. So one simple error, and you can become a sports goat. One simple error in life, you're kind of 
label that, aren't you? You could be gone away for 40 years and come back and someone's going to say, I remember you. You did this in my orchard tree or, or you threw eggs at my house or toilet paper. I didn't do any of those eggs now. I'm just saying that they could say that when he was a kid. But you name these things. But sometimes being a goat can be a good thing. Now, when I talk about GOAT, I'm using it really, this is an acronym I'm going to use. G-O-A-T, greatest of all times. That's what I mean by GOAT. And, for instance, New York Yankees pitcher uh, Orino Riviera, he's a GOAT. Greatest of all times. He, he, he's probably the greatest relief pitcher of, of all times. He achieved uh, more than 650 saves and a great postseason. Also, there's a soccer star, uh, Abby Webick. Uh, world, he holds a real, uh, most career goals in international matches. So he's considered a GOAT because they're one of the greatest of all time. So you see the greatest, you have to either have a great record of world championships or Olympics or something like that. So everybody wants to be seen then as a GOAT, which is a good thing. So who are the GOATs of the Bible? You ever thought about that? Who are the really sticks out? And of course, we know there's Abraham, Sarah, Moses, David, Isaiah, uh, Mary, Joseph, and of course, Jesus Christ himself. Jesus is the one who's standing on the right hand of God, according to Acts. And according to today's passage, the, Jesus is the greatest of them all, and we know that. But who else? There are many, many goats in the Bible that are not well known or we talk about much. We talk about these other, from Abraham to Sarah to David and Joseph, and we, we, we talk about these. But what about the ones that are not mentioned too well? For instance, Stephen. Yeah, he was the first martyr of the church. And what did Stephen do? What happened to make him get thrown out of the church, taken to the wayside, and stoned and killed, and not by the Roman soldiers now? We're talking about church people. We're talking about the priests. We're talking about that they drug him out because he had said something they didn't like. Gosh, just like we had that today. We had the gullies full of Christians, wouldn't we? I didn't like that. Let's drag him out back and stone him. I'm glad we don't do that today. Bobby didn't pick up a rock already. But Stephen's story begins when a controversy arises in, in Jer uh, Jerusalem's church over the imbalance of uh, daily distribution of food to the widows. So there's kind of dissension there. And the 12 apostles called together the whole Christian community and what a church always do, they form a committee. They're going to form a committee to see what is the problem that they're having, this imbalance. Well, the church selects seven men of good standing and gives them a job of waiting on tables. So if we select each one of you here to wait on tables at our next uh, meal, uh, we'll kind of be doing it like the Bible says, right, God? But they chose seven, and Stephen was one of them. And I love talking about hospitality because this is what's good hospitality here. Now, the first of these three men, Stephen, says that he was a man full of faith and the Holy Spirit in verse 5. Full of faith and the Holy Spirit. He was zealous. I'm sure when they selected him that he was excited about going and doing these things. He was so excited that he would get to go and serve the people. Now, we know ourselves, if we are selected or asked to do something, uh, sometimes we get a little disgruntled, don't we? Oh, why did they pick me? I've got so much other stuff to do. Why didn't they pick somebody else? Oh, now that doesn't really show that we have a lot of spirit going on there, does it? But Stephen did. He was excited about this. So Stephen begins to serve the Christian community and becomes known for, a great, for his great wonders and signs that he did. In verse 8, talks about that. The great wonders and signs he does among the people. He has so much Holy Spirit and so much spirit and faith that he was performing these wonders and signs, not trickery, not magic tricks, but things from God. 
And guess what? His opponents in the synagogue argued with him and drum up charges against him, accusing him of blasphemous against the word of Moses and God. Here he is serving the community and doing these wonderful signs before the people. They was jealous. They were thinking that well, they would be thinking Stephen has more spirit and more faith, which he did, than they did. So the people of Jerusalem became angry at Stephen, as do the elders and the scribes. So Stephen is seized and brought before the Jewish council, where the high priest asked him, Are these things so what they're talking to me about? These make these false accusations, and you know, this really, these guys are coming up and telling a flat out lie on Stephen. Good Christian folks that's inside the church, that's inside the building, worshiping God, knowing Moses, knowing the laws, knowing everything about God, but yet they went and told a story about Stephen. Now, does that happen today? Of course it does. Someone would talk about this other person. They can't wait to talk about that person. And sometimes they like to stretch it a little bit. Sometimes they stretch it a lot. And it looks like they're trying to build their self up more than they are the person that they're talking about. We had this event uh, this past week, and, and I've seen some of these things that happens when you get a bunch of people together. They start, well, this person over here has not come because this person said this or that. You start getting these things instead of lifting you up. And Stephen here was serving the people and showing them wonderful signs and showing them the glory of God through him. But yet, these lies were brought up against him. So he asked him, are these things so? Verse 7, 1 says that. So Stephen takes a deep breath and begins to speak. He takes his audience on a tour of the mighty acts of God, beginning with Abraham and ending deaths of the prophets and even Jesus himself. Stephen went on to tell them about all the miracles and all the things that happened during these times and how did they destroy the deaths of the prophets before because they're speaking the truth. And that's why Christ was put to death because he was speaking the truth. Stephen concludes with a statement that boldly speaks the truth of power. He says, you are the ones that received the law as ordained by angels, and yet you have not kept them. That's in verse 53 of Acts. He says, you are the ones that received the law. You're the ones that written them down and from the Old Testament on, but yet you do not keep them. And don't you know that really made the high priest made them very angry because they thought that they were better than their congregation, that they were better than the other people because they wore a robe, because they wore outfits and they would proclaim and speak loudly out in different areas. They wanted to be seen. They wanted to be heard. And they thought they were better. But for Stephen to tell them that you don't even keep your own laws. And he goes on and says, you have not kept the law of God you elders and scribes and priests, you have not done this. You say you are followers of God, but you're not. That's pretty bold of Stephen, isn't it? Because back then, if you said anything against the church, you were doomed just about. They're going to punish you. But Stephen says, you are not followers of God. Boy, that had to hurt. I know if someone would tell you that, would that bother you? Would that hurt your feelings if someone come up and told you, you're not much of a follower of God, you're not even a follower of God? What actions are you doing for them to say that to you? I know sometimes when you correct someone that's, and you're being a Christian about it in the right way, correcting someone, telling them they're not following God's ways or, or they're doing uh, in, in a sinful way, and they're going to say, well, who are you to judge me? We hear that all the time. Who are you to do this? But I'm talking about if someone comes up in something that you're doing wrong and say you're not a follower of God, how would that affect you? I know it would affect me pretty heavily. Not only probably make me angry, but kind of make me upset to look at myself. What am I doing? I can imagine 
these high priests. His words stunned the council, as you might expect, because never before have they been spoken to this way. You just don't speak to the high priest this way. Remember Paul? He didn't know the high priest he was speaking to and got slapped. <laughs> yeah, he got smacked because he was speaking harshly. He said, well, I'm sorry, I didn't know who I was speaking to. So then they become enraged and begin to grind at their teeth. They've been so mad that you just grind your teeth. I have. One thing got down to the nubs, but we've all been that angry at something. They were so angry that they bit down on their teeth and grit it, and they just were getting ready to tear them to pieces. Knowing that he was in trouble, Stephen puts himself in the hands of God. When we're in trouble, we put our hands, we put ourselves in the hands of God. For God to reach down and cuddle us, comfort us, lift us up. And you know, some things we think that, well, I will feel good if that happens. Sometimes it doesn't feel that good because God is telling you you're wrong. This is what you need to do. And we don't want to do it. So we have a change of mind, but still we lift ourselves and say, God, take us. Direct us. So he was filled with the Holy Spirit. He looks upward and says this. He says, I see the heavens open and the Son of Man, the risen Jesus, standing at the right hand of God. Filled with the Holy Spirit. He's looking upward and all this anger around him and all these, they're dragging him, they're pulling him and taking him out to, to, to kill Stephen. And he looks up and he sees the heavens open. He sees Jesus Christ probably with his arms open saying, come, I'm coming to get you. Not to destroy the people around him that's going to take him out. Not to do that. But he's taking him out of that situation. He's taking him away from that stone. And yes, his body's going to hit, hurt. His body's going to die, but his spirit's going to live forever. Christ is taking him up. He sees that vision. And I really feel that when our time is to go, is that when we close our eyes, it's not going to be no total darkness. It's going to be that bright, wonderful light of Jesus Christ saying, come, come to me. The angels carry you up into his arms. That's what Stephen was seeing. He knew that death was coming. His words make the council even more furious when with a shout they rushed and they grabbed him. Who is he that can look up and say he sees God in heaven? Who is this man that they say in blasphemous words against Moses and God can see God in heaven? That confirms it. He is blasphemous. Let's take him out and let's drag him out to the city where they began to stone him. Rocks raining on him and he prays, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. He wasn't cursing. He wasn't angry at the mob saying, quit throwing these rocks and just really all upset and anger at what the, was going on around him. He had the faith in the Holy Spirit. That he says, Jesus, receive my spirit. Because he knew that he could not control that situation at all. He kneels down and cries out his final words. He says, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. That's powerful. Stephen becomes a martyr, the first of many to give his life for the Christian faith. We see a lot of tragic on TV where someone has taken a life. And we hear and see the family members sometimes so angry at that person that took one of their loved one's life that they said, I will never forget that person. I wish he was dead. I want to kill him myself. I want to do this to him. Now, what does the Bible teach us? What is Stephen teaching us here? What did Christ teach us on the cross? Yes, we're angry that that person might have took our loved one. But here, Stephen to death said, please, don't lay this sin on them. Even though they're taking my life, which one of their own commandments said, I shall, you know, you do not kill someone. He says, God, please, don't lay this sin against them. They're taking his life. 
what will we do? Will we cry upon God, send a light bolt, just wipe out every one of them, send a lightning bolt, strike them dead, do it, God, right now, do it. Will we say that or will we be saying, God, forgive them and don't hold this against them? That's Christian love, isn't it? What if God listened to us immediately? We'd be missing a lot of folks around our families, around our friends and stuff, around people we know. But aren't we glad that our Father in Heaven is wise and He sees the right things to do? Because we are sinners. One sin is no greater than the other. When we look at one, so I know we look at homosexuality sometimes, oh, it's a horrible sin, we don't want this, we don't want right that. We pray for that sin to go away. But yet, when we sit down and eat a feast, the Bible says gluttony is a sin. Wasteful is a sin. Look how much food we waste. We sin every day. There's no magic number there in saying, well, this sin's greater than this one. Here's a scale of 1 to 10 over here for this sin. God said all sin is. And we're all are sinners and fall short of the glory of God. So who are we to judge and not say we forgive the ones that beats us down, talks bad about us, or even kills one of our loved ones. We have justice and we pray that our justice system works. But we should pray for that individual, for that person's soul, that it will be changed, that God will change that person, that God will forgive that person, and let God's will be done in that person's lives. He sent Jesus Christ on the cross for our sins, the blood He shed for me and you for our sins. We undeserve it, right? We do not deserve it. And we know when someone trespasses against us, they do not deserve it. We want to get revenge. We want to turn it around and say, God, we pray that you take care of us. And I know a woman that does this, or did this. If someone kind of made her mad, she'd pray against them. That God would cause harm upon them. Because you got to think, how many people are praying that God would do harm against you? If someone's doing it against them. I'm glad that we have a wonderful God that doesn't do that. So Acts tells us that the witnesses to Stephen's speech and stoning, their coats were even laid down at Saul, his feet. After the death of Stephen, we learned that Saul approved the killing of Stephen. Approved it. And we're reading his scriptures that, that Paul wrote these letters to these churches. And we, when we go by this as an inspiration of the Word of God through Paul, and we're looking at this, and we're praising God, and here he approves the stoning death of Stephen. A man that's full of the Holy Spirit and faith. Who is this Paul? He was a persecutor of Christians. But he's changed. He's changed by the Word of God. He is changed by God Himself. Of course, Stephen is clearly one of the greatest of all times. He's a goat. He knows the story of God's almighty acts, which was recorded in the Bible. He speaks of uncomfortable truths to the people in power. He faithfully puts his life in the hands of God and follows the example of Jesus Christ. He knew the scriptures. And that's a key thing with us. As knowledge in God's Word, we need to study God's Word. We need to get into God's Word and know what it's saying. We need to read our Bibles on a daily basis. That where we can absorb the words of God. 
Who knows what you read that morning might be a blessing for you later that day to comfort you when something happens. Or lift you up. Or be able to talk to someone that's having a difficult time. You said, you know, I read this passage this morning. You got to have the knowledge in the Word of God before you be able to speak it intelligently to someone that doesn't. How can I talk to you about rebuilding your motor in your car and I have not one ounce of skills in building a motor? If I did, I'd be a nice, good mechanic. I wouldn't have to take my motorcycle to Tom Dooley either. <laughs> But you know, I don't have those skills because I don't study that. But to have the skills to be able to talk to someone about the Word of God intelligently, you've got to know the Bible. You've got to know what you're talking about. We need that training, that knowledge, the courage and faithful. And most of all, we need that forgiving spirit. We lack that forgiving spirit a bunch. That's probably one of our worst weakness. Because we don't want to forgive. We want to get even, don't we? We want to get even so bad to show them and go, ah, ha, ha, see, I got you. We as kids, that was fine doing that, wasn't we? We were saying, I got you for this and that, especially when brothers and sisters. But now that we've grown up in the spirit of God, we've got the meat of the word of God. Forgiveness. We've got to learn. We've got to absorb that. And we've got to show that. By forgiving your enemies, what are you doing? And I don't want you to use this as a saying, aha, I got you back. So I'm going to forgive them because they're going to get heaps of cold on their head. And that's not how you use it. You forgive them. And if God wants to heap the colds, He can do it, right? But you truly forgive them. Now, if he stole everything in your house and you replenished it, you can invite them back. You're not going to leave your house for them to sit, are you? You're just going to use some little bit of common sense, and, but you're going to use forgiveness and love. And that's what Stephen did. He showed the people in the community, even all the others around him, no matter who they were, that he loved them, he forgave them, even his enemies even to that community that he was serving, to the widows. They all witnessed the stoning of Stephen and heard that cry, Father, forgive them for this sin. What a testimony. May we give that testimony to others in our walk in a Christian life. Let us pray. Dear Heavenly Father, I want to thank you for your message today, your words of comfort, Father. We ask, Father, that you give us the strength, the strength to be able to speak your words, to acknowledge your words to others that's without. Give us a forgiving spirit, Father. We ask, Lord, that your blessing and your spirit will rest upon each one here today. In Jesus' name, amen.